Good morning. I'm Ken Macklin, pastor of First United Methodist Church of Port Angeles. This morning, I'm going to preach on the value of love, the Holy Gospel according to Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And the man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Sell all that you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were perplexed at this. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything to follow you. Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house, brothers, or sisters, mother, father, children, or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Years ago, in the 60s and the 70s, I saw a movement, a movement of the spirit, uh, unlike I've ever witnessed before. Quite honestly, I was a little bit bored with religion and church and I was feeling a sense of pointlessness and I remember praying and said, God, give me life or give me death. I wanted reality. And about this time, the Spirit seemed to be moving in the Catholic Church. The Spirit seemed to be moving among young people. The Spirit was moving among mainline churches. Something was going on. Something was happening. It wasn't a program, it wasn't a project, it was a movement. I'm reminded of a professor I had back in seminary, his name was Orr, Professor Orr. And there's a story told about him and I just heard someone speaking on this and I'd like to share her thoughts about this because I thought, well, that's what we have in common. I did have Orr. He taught in, he taught in England, he also taught here in the United States. And there's a story about Orr taking his students to different places and they finally went to Epworth, to Wesley's rectory, the place where he lived, the place where he ate. They toured the kitchen, they looked around and saw all these things and when he went up to the second floor into his bedroom, someone noticed that on the carpet there were two indentations. And Orr said, that's where Wesley prayed for hours upon hours in the morning before he would go out and do his ministry. You see, at that time, there was a movement to the Wesleyan brothers, and the movement was in England. People were coming alive. People were converting. The power of God was being manifested. It was said of Wesley that he would walk among uh, people, and they would just touch him, and they would be healed. And someone asked John Wesley, why, why do people come out why do people come out and hear you preach? And he said this, 
People come out here to see me burn myself. And what he meant by that was the power of the Spirit, the fire of the Spirit. May the Holy Spirit come and kindle fire in our hearts once again. But on this occasion, uh, Orr took them in the bedroom, and as they were getting ready to leave, he got on the bus and began to count all the students. One was missing. And he went back into the house looking, he went upstairs, and there was a young man kneeling at the same place where Wesley, and he heard him say, Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again and let it begin with me. And Orr walked around the bed and put his hands on his shoulder and said, it's time to go. And at that moment, Billy Graham got up. And guess what? God did it again. What's it going to take for God to do it again? I think it's going to take two things, essentially. The power of God's love. Jesus looked on this young man and loved him and said, there's one thing you lack. I wonder what Jesus would say to me. I wonder what Jesus would say to you if he looked you in the eye and loved on you and said, there's one thing you lack. I wonder what it would be. But I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with love. And I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with relationships. Some years ago, during the, as I said, during the 60s and 70s, I saw this movement. And I became a part of a ministry called the New Birth Ministries. It was ministering to young people. People had drug problems. People had alcohol problems. We were ministering to these young people and helping them to recover, helping them to, to come out of that life and, and walk in the, in, the, in the light. There was a man by the name of Johnny Kay. I'm going to change the names a little bit, but he was a radio just jockey, and he got involved in this new birth ministry. In fact, he was one of the founders of it. And he would simply say on the radio station, WHOT Hotspot in Youngstown, Ohio, hey, we're having a new birth at this church, or we're having a new birth at this place. And, and we didn't organize, we didn't know, we just simply showed up. And there was a young guitarist by the name of Phil Kage. That may not mean anything to you, but Jimi Hendrix should. And Jimi Hendrix was being interviewed on Johnny Kay's show. And Johnny Kay asked Jimi Hendrix, who's the world's greatest guitar player besides yourself? And he said, it's Phil Kage, who played with the glass harp. And they performed before hundreds of thousands of people. But he was a part of this ministry. He had a passion for God. He had an awakening. He had a conversion. God changed his mind, changed his heart. And all he wanted to do was to love on people. And so people would call in from all over the tri-state, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, call into the radio station and say, Johnny, we want to have a new birth at our church. We want to have a new birth here. And someone called in from Coshocton, Ohio, and said, we'd like to have a new birth here. Will you come? And Johnny said, yeah, we'll come. We had two vans, we loaded up, took some kids, and we went down to Coshocton. And when we got there, and we got in front of the address, it turned out to be a bar. And we were going like, are we supposed to do this? And it was Phil Kage, 16 years old, who said, God has brought us here for a reason. And so we went into this bar, they got on, there was sawdust on the floor, people sitting at the bar. I remember walking around trying to get the fill, and... Phil was singing, people were, kids were talking about their stories, and I, I heard these two men talking, and, and one said to the other, I, I think they're singing about Jesus over there. And he said, no. And he looked, yeah, they're singing about Jesus over there. And I kind of figured, well, this is going to be tough territory here. So it was my turn to share, and I preached that night, and I preached my heart out, and, and I felt led just to call people forward if they wanted to receive Christ and these guys and others knelt down on that dance floor in that bar and made their peace with God. Now what I didn't know was that the owner of the bar was one of those persons and he called me up 
And he said, hey, I, I'm new at this. I don't know what to do. Uh, I need to come up there two hours away. I want to come to a Bible. I said, well, come over to my place. We have a Bible study every Thursday or whatever day it was. And he would come. Every day he'd come up and travel. And about a year later, he called and said, I'd like for you to come and do another new birth. And I said, okay, let me check it out. And we went back, except it was no longer a bar. He converted into a Christian coffee house, and that was a big thing back in those days. I'm reminded of, of the Apostle Paul, Saul, who loved God with, with all his heart. I mean, he had passion for God. He had to be right. He persecuted the church because he loved God, not because he hated Christians. He loved God, and they were disobedient to God, so he persecuted them. And he was there and complicit in the stoning of Stephen. And Stephen said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Exactly the same words that Jesus uttered from the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Saul heard this. And he was thinking about these things as he was traveling to Damascus to do more persecution. And all of a sudden, a bolt of lightning came out of the sky and struck Saul. He fell from the horse and he was on the ground and he was blind and he heard these words Saul, Saul why are you persecuting me? In other words Saul, you lack one thing and Saul had enough sense, he had enough background, enough education and religion to know and he said Lord is that you? Yes, it is me, Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And Saul was transformed. He went to a place, they laid hands, Ananias laid hands on him. He received the Spirit, and from that moment on, he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a long story, but his life was changed. His, he lacked one thing. What is the one thing that you and I lack so that God can do it again? love in us, love through us. So here's the value of love. There are four Greek words that we translate as love. And I'm going to go through this so you understand that love is a, a, a dynamic process of calling us into relationships that calls us into peace and harmony with God, peace and harmony with one another. We are called to peace and harmony as a reflection, as a witness for God. The first word you probably are familiar with because it gets bantered around is agape love. And everyone says, well, agape love is divine love. Divine love, it's a perfect love. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Agape means this. It is all-inclusive, which means we act in love toward everyone and we act justly with everyone. We show no favoritism. It is a kind of love that transcends our differences. It's a kind of love that calls us into unity. It's a kind of love that calls us into peace and harmony. It's a kind of love in which Jesus looks in each of our eyes and said, I love you, but you lack one thing. What is that one thing? That's agape love. Then there's a, another word that gets translated for love. It's called phileo. It, we get the word Philadelphia, friendship. It means friends. Now, here's the key to that. Moltmann once said this, a theologian. He said, you don't make friends, you discover your friends. And when you discover a friend, you better keep them close to you because a friend is someone who is always there, will listen to everything you have to say, will not judge you, will care for you, and walk through you through all the turmoil and all the frustrations of your life and you know you are, you are safe in the presence of a friend. That's a friend. Jesus calls us to be friends. Jesus calls us to be friends even with our enemies. He calls us to be friends in the church. It's a safe place. But then he'll look in your eye and look in my eye and he'll look in the church's eye and say, but you lack one thing. There's another word for uh, love. It's called storge. It means 
family blood, we're, we're related by family. I don't think it's by accident that we do communion and, and talk about the blood of Jesus. Sometimes we take that literally, but basically it is saying we are united as a family in the blood of Christ. I have, my brother and I, we have the blood of my mom and dad running through our veins. So we're, we're related. But I remember when I moved to California, I'd go back and I'd visit my brother and he would, he would be sitting in the kitchen and he, and he just was not very happy at that time. He was involved in union stuff, political stuff. And then I would go off and visit my brothers and sisters down in Youngstown, that community that I was a part of for those years. And he got mad at me and he said, why are you always going down there? This is your family, your mother and your father and your family. Why are you going down there to hang out with your friends all the time? You should stay here. And I said, brother, I said, do you really want to know? Yeah, I want to know. And I said, well, the blood of mom and dad run through our veins. That makes us family. But the blood of Christ is what bonds me to my brothers and sisters in Christ. And he just looked at me. He didn't understand. I could tell he was uncomfortable. He was confused. Uh, and I could see he was still angry. Well, the following year, I went back to visit my mom. I'd always visit my mom at her birthday. Her birthday was October the 7th. And I would always visit her a couple days before, just as a surprise. She never knew when I was coming. And so I'd always just show up, and it would be a surprise. And my brother would pick me up. But this time, my brother was acting a little bit strange. And I thought, this is not like my brother. Because my brother, he's just, he kind of walked around like this with a lot of anger. But now he's kind of smiling and... Uh, I said, okay, something's going on here. I don't know what's going on here. So we went to my mother's house, and I'm, my mother's surprised. We're hugging. I'm looking over my brother, and, and he's just kind of smiling and laughing. And I said, all right, brother, what's going on? What's going on? He said, well, this past year, he said, I met Christ. And now the blood of Christ runs through us you don't have to go down to Youngstown anymore. You can stay home. And we just had a big laugh of that. And I said, well, listen, why don't you come with me? And so I took him with me, introduced him to all my friends. They embraced him as a brother, embraced him as a family. So the blood of Christ is the family. This is, that, this is how we're related. We need, well, some families are probably toxic and broken anyway, but that needs to be transcended to be a family where we care about each other, where we can share our stories, where we can talk about our love for God. We can share whatever it is that's on our hearts and minds, and it builds the body of Christ up. Anything that we do to break down the body, to break the relationship, that's the thing that's lacking. And that's what Jesus would say if he looked into my eyes and to your eyes, you lack one thing, and that is peace and harmony and love and attachments you let go of those things that's what was wrong with this young man when he said give away everything that you have and he had many possessions and he began to grieve because those possessions possessed him he had an inordinate attachment to them he couldn't let them go I don't know that Jesus would say to him you really have to do this he was showing him where his true love was his true love was for his possessions and his money and not other people and not God. And then there's finally eros. And this again is one of those misused or misunderstood words because we think of erotica. It's oh, it must be lust. It must be sinful. It must be this. No, it doesn't mean that. It means passion. It just simply means passion. Now for the Christian family, it means we have passion for one person. But we have to have passion for God. We have to have passion for our churches. We have to have passion for people. We have to have the kind of passion that allows us to share our faith in such a way that it brings people to Christ. The value of love is loving other people into being. Loving another person by willing to risk your faith and share your story that will bring people peace and harmony and love. The Holy Spirit cultivates the value of love. 
the Holy Spirit cultivates the value of freedom. The Holy Spirit cultivates shalom, peace. Have peace with God and peace with yourselves in the name of Jesus. So what is the one thing that we lack? May I suggest, may I suggest, it might just be the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that cultivates all four of those loves, that cultivates peace, that cultivates authentic freedom. Have peace among yourselves and live in harmony. Amen.